The views on this program do not reflect those of ONTV or its board of directors. Welcome to OAA Now, your home for Oakland Activities Association news and information. Here's your host. Sammy Terramina. Welcome to OA Now here. I'm Sammy Terramina, blogger around the OA, the host of Blast 3 Brain Cells, and the host of Between Terraminas on OA Enable Television. I'd like to welcome those watching on the local voice on SoundCloud, those watching on OA Enable Television, and also those watching on YouTube. A lot to talk about this week here. Obviously, we're going to talk. We got a lot of news that broke around the league this week. Um, obviously, in girls basketball, we had the Kellen James. Um, Kellen James stepping out at Stony Creek. I will give you my thoughts there on that. Also, um, a lot of football games, of course. I've started to get an idea of everybody in the playoffs, obviously, um, where where everybody stands coming into the postseason. So a, real, a lot to look at this week here on the pod. Let's start with our main story here. Um, obviously, in girls basketball, um, Kellen James um, has been at Stony Creek um, a long while. I mean, like, He's been, I mean, like he, um, he's been an assistant at Stony under Coach Brad Crichton. Um, he took over the head coaching gig in 2015. Um, he stepped down on, um, he stepped down on Tuesday. Um, you know, and I mean, like, and, and it's unfortunate, you know what I mean? That, you know, the fact that, you know, um, that he had to step down. Um, it was a shocker. I mean, especially when you look at girls basketball season starting up in about a month or so um, that, you know, he would, you know, he would step down. Um, James did cite parent involvement as the reason why he stepped down. Um, you know, he did, he did write a um, very descriptive resignation letter um, to, um, to um, Adams, to Stony Creek principal, Brian Shelston, um, explaining his decision it was not an easy decision. Um, very grateful for the opportunity to coach at Stony. Um, he's produced some really good players, and he also explained why that he decided to step down um, coaching the Cougars. Um, you know, and I think you know when you look at it here, and I and you know obviously you look at the pedigree that Kellen James has done with Stony Creek, um, forty six and eleven the last three years. I mean, he was ninety seven and fifty nine his eight years coaching the program, but forty six and eleven his three year, last three years. That's success right there. That's real success. And, but when you look at the situation here, into some parents' eyes, it's not enough. And I don't know what the issues were, and I'm not going there, what the issues were. But it kind of looks to me like, you know what I mean? You know, there's always two sides to the story. You know, you know, there's always that. So... You know, so it's really curious to see how, you know, especially when you look at Stony Creek as a program that's had a ton of success. I mean, Kellen James has coached some really good players. I mean, Gabby Urich, Mia Carson, Megan Solick, Sydney LaPrairie. Um, they were among others that really impacted, that really was huge to the program. Of course, Kellen, Coach Kellen James won some district championships. I know he's, I think he's won a regional, I'm not sure. Um, but when you really look at the impact of what he's done to that program, you know, especially, you know, when you look at the situation he's been in, I mean, you look at the situation, you know, that um, he's had to deal with. I mean, he's brought a lot of success to that program at Stony. I mean, he really did. Um, I really thought, you know, Stony Creek was the most consistent when you look at success. Um, they've had some down years, yes, but I really felt like the last three years he's really started to turn the corner with that program. Um, so now you look at this situation now with James no longer there. Um, now there's some question marks. I mean, you look at this year's Stony Creek team, they're going to be good. I mean, they're going to be solid. Um, they have Sarah LaPerry back coming back. You have Emily Flynn, you have Merrick Schlaubach, Taylor Fulkerson. Izzy Avage, um, you know, obviously you look at um, you look at Stony Creek situation. They're in a division where it's going to be tough. I mean, you look at West Bluefield, who's got almost everybody. You got, I got Davis sisters back, obviously. Um, you look at Lake Orion. Yes, they lost a lot of talent, but Izzy 
Walensky's back for them. Um, Clarkson, obviously, with um, Ellie Roback, Emily Valencia back. Um, and then you look at, of course, um, Oxford, who comes in the division. They return three starters. Um, so, and your district's brutal. So, when I'm looking at Stony Creek situation now, I mean, I look at Stony Creek situation right now, and I look at the postseason with them. Because when I look at the district coming up for them, it's the same district as last year, but they're hosting the district. I mean, Rochester, yes, they got, yes, they got Alice Mack and Kylie Robinson. They got questions at the guards. Adams, you know, I think is going to be better. I think Adams is better. Romeo, I think it's going to be better. And Utica Eisenhower, I got some questions. So, the district looks manageable. The question for me is, who's going to take over that program now that James is no longer there? I mean, there are some candidates there that I think could do it. But the question for me is, are they there long term? Then you got to look at the sub varsities. You got to look at program strength. The question is, will the new coach, how will he handle program, he or she handle program strength? Um, how will they handle, you know, the development from, from the kids at heart going to Stony Creek? You know, and I think that's the big question I have for the new coach going forward. Um, obviously, when you look at this season, I mean, coming in, Stony Creek had a ton of high expectations. They still do. They got a lot of experience coming back. But when you look at this season now, you know that Kellen James is no longer there. It's going to put pressure on the players to perform. You know, you look at obviously with the situation, yes, I know Stony Creek's got a rapid parent base. They got a rap, I mean, like they're very passionate crew over there. But if Stony Creek this year is at 500 or below 500, where would you put the blame? Where would you put full blame? Because you can't blame Kellen James here. You can't blame the players here. You can't blame the coaching staff here. And unfortunately, those, you know, then there's the parents. Because when you look at the situation, but that is, but, you know, you look at, of course, obviously, when you look at other situations, I mean, you look at the, um, you look at, of course, what happened at Lake Orion, you know, when they, and for the boys program, when Joel Shorter stepped down, um, Jose Andradas took over, stabilized the ship, and Lake Orion had a nice year, won a share of the white title. I think that's what Stony Creek is banking on. But if this team is at 500 or or just or under 500, then there has to be some blame around. There has to be blame. And unfortunately, you know, you know, and I think, you know, a lot of people look at who's to blame for it. You know what I mean? If they do struggle. I mean, like, if it's a failed season for Stony Creek, because there is a lot of pressure now on the players, you know, for because now with Kellen James no longer there, and also on, you know, for um, for them to perform. Because I'll be honest with you, if, I'll be honest with you, bottom line is, you know, if that team struggles, then, you know, that's not on the players, it's not on the interim coaches, that's going to be, I think it's going to be fully, it has to be on the parents. It has to. Because when you look at James's, James's um, resignation letter, he did say parent involvement was the reason why he stepped down. So that's basically, I'm looking at this year with Stony Creek is, okay, now the pressure is on you. There, the pressure's on you. So that's basically what it is, is can Stony Creek perform to the expectation without Kellen James? That is the big question because you're looking at that division 
It is brutal. You are looking at the you're looking at the um in the postseason. You gotta go through Rochester. Utica Eisenhower is not bad. I think Adams is improved. And I also think that um Romeo is also improved. So if this is a failed season, this is gonna fall on the parents. And I'm not being me. But that's the bottom line. That's really it. So We'll see what happens. We'll keep an eye on the situation um, regarding the Stony Creek situation. But, you know, who takes over as the, as the interim coach or it could be the full-time coach. Um, it's something to really keep an eye on. Um, so we'll see what happens there. All right, now let's go from girls basketball to football. Um, oh, I also forgot, you know what I mean, For um, back to um, Stony Creek girls basketball um, for a minute. Um, where where would, where would I see Kellen James going? I mean, like, I think I could see him as an assistant this year. But I can also see maybe, maybe as an assistant at Orchard Lake St. Mary's under Brad Crichton. I mean, obviously Crichton, of course, coaching the um, Eaglets this year. Or, you know what I mean? He could go elsewhere. I mean, he's got plenty of options this season to really look at. I mean, to be an assistant coach. So, we'll see. But it w- I'll be honest with you. Don't be surprised next year, you know, he gets a coaching job somewhere. Don't be surprised. I think he's a great coach. He produces results. I mean, you know, it just was a very tough situation at Stony Creek, that, you know, that unfortunately happened, um, you know. So we'll see what happens. I mean, there's a lot of pressure now over there, you know, to see who Stony Creek goes in the interim basis. But also, if it's a failed season, a lot of people know where, where, where the blame's going to likely have to be on. So, we'll see what happens. Um, now let's go to football. I mean, obviously, when you look at football now, um, we're starting to get nitty gritty. We're on week seven. Um, some teams have started to figure out where their postseason, um, where their postseason dreams are at right now. There's a couple teams there that <clears throat> I think's got some great opportunities around, surrounding them. Um, when I look at the games this week, um, it, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the first game I'm going to look at is going to be in the gold division. Um, you know, I'm looking at Ferndale 61, Berkeley 8. Colin Hawk threw five touchdowns in that game for um, Ferndale. It looks like to me Ferndale is back. It really does look like to me that the Eagles are back to where they need to be, but they got to keep winning. When I look at their schedule coming up, I mean, they got they got to play Oak Park, Groves, and St. Clair Shores, Lakeshore to close out the year. I mean, they, they played a tough schedule. Um, for Ferndale, for me, when I look at them to get back into the postseason, they're going to have to either win out or win two of the next, or two or three, just to get in the playoffs. I mean, and I'm looking at that schedule. Oak Park is a must win for them. Groves, Groves a must win. And then St. Clair Shores, South Lake Shore is a must win. So it's not an easy road for them. Um, so when I look at Ferndale, you know, if they win two or three, that should get them into the playoffs. It should get them in. And then on Berkeley's side, you know, how do you explain this, the record, 0-6? Five of the six losses have been at Hurley Field. That is, that is mind-boggling. That you lose five of six on your home field and you haven't even been competitive in, these, in those games. The only game you've been competitive was, was Pontiac, and it was 34-28. So, I know there's a lot of issues over there at Berkeley. And, you know, I'm hoping Coach Sean Shields gets this thing fixed. I hope he does. Because this is not Berkeley football with the way that that team's been performing. I mean, honestly, you know, they've got some issues they got to fix. They've really got some issues. And they sit. At 0 and 6, they were blown on their homecoming. I mean, it's it's just hard to explain, 
hard to put in the words what's been going on there, Burke. It's, it is. It's really hard to just put in the words what's going on over there. Um, Royal Oak and Pontiac. Um, the Royal Oak and um, Avondale, that game was 42 nothing in favor of Avondale. Um, again, Avondale, as I talked last week on the pod with Coach Bob Meyer, it just they're handling their business. The kids are handling their business. I mean, they were dominant. They were the better team. I mean, they played well. I mean, give them props there. You got to give them props. And then on the flip side, Royal Oak, you know, offensively, this team's a problem offensively. I'm not being mean to their defense, but their defense, their defense has been Coach Colin Campbell's calling card all year. I mean, really has been. Um, bottom line is, and you look at that, and you look at that and say, okay, you know, Royal Oak, yes, they're going through a, t- through a tough rebuild. They're going through a rebuild. I mean, that's not a question. But when you really look at the situation there, um, I think they got an identity figured out a little bit, and that's their defense. Their defense is going to have to win them games. I mean, and I'm not knocking on Avno. Avno's a very good team. But if you're, and they're state ranked right now. But when you look at Royal Oak's case, you know, maybe, you know what I mean? You know, your defense, about, your defense is going to be your calling card for years to come. It's going to be that way. But your offense has got to change. I'm not being mean to you, but your offense has to change. You can't just be a power-running football team. You can't. You're going to have to throw the ball. Maybe go more of the RPO. Maybe go more of a spread. You know what I mean? Maybe go more of, you know, and I think Coach Colin Campbell's starting to get it a little bit. He's starting to get it, which is kind of a good thing. But it's going to take a while for those kids, especially those in the lower levels, if you're trying, if you're changing offenses and you're changing coaches, you know, it's going to take a while for them to adjust, even if you're changing a whole new offense around. But I think personally, you got to look at personnel. And personnel, you know, honestly, you know, it doesn't favor them. It just doesn't. I mean, like, so I would think, honestly, maybe for Coach Colin Campbell this offseason, really to look at the personnel of that team. Really do. Um, let's go to the Saturday game. Um, Pontiac and Troy Athens. Um, it was an interesting game. I mean, Pontiac um, fell to Troy Athens 35-15. Um, kind of was surprised at the score. Um, but, you know, Troy Athens took advantage of the middle quarters, but a 20-27 lead at one point. Um, Pontiac scored to make it 35, I mean, 28 to 15, but, you know, um, Pontiac went down and Athens went down and scored a touchdown to make it 35, 15. Um, I give Pontiac a lot of credit, Coach Wendell Jefferson, for them for being very competitive in that game. But I just think the difference was Troy Athens' depth. I just think in that game, because, you know, Pontiac's not a big team. I mean, they're not. But, you know, give credit to Troy Athens, um, Really, the Red Hawks really, you know, they really, um, you know, they, they they needed they picked up a win that they needed, um, in a big way. Um, basically, Dash and Pontiac's playoff hopes, um, this season. But I think you know when you look at Troy Athens' case, you know, I don't know if I see a playoff pass for them right now. Um, just with the way that everything's been going, I've looked at the math, I've looked at everything here, and it just doesn't look like there's a good avenue for Troy Athens, um, this season. Um, and then, and then on the flip side, you look at Pontiac, um, it just keeps getting better, you know, just gotta get better, um, just improving each day, just getting yourself better, um, if they can do that, um, then I think Pontiac will be will be ready for bigger and better things. Um, but Pontiac's right now, I think, heading in the right direction. Um, just a, a tough loss to a um, to a good program. 
I mean, that's really what it is. I mean, well, Troy Athens, they're, they're they're solid, not great, but, you know, but still, you know, where Pontiac's been, you know, in the past few years, I mean, like, you know, so we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. Um, let's go now to the blue. Um, you know, when I look at Seaholm and Troy, um, Seaholm really spread the wealth in their game against Troy. I mean, they were the better team in that game against Troy. And it was 42-6. to six. I mean, Seaholm has had a habit of just exposing Troy for exposing Troy. The last two years, they've outscored Troy 94-6. to six. And then the last four weeks, Seaholm has, has scored 198 points. That's impressive. For a team that only scored 10 points in their loss against UD Jesuit, and for them to score 198 points, and have only allowed 20 points in three weeks, that's impressive for Coach Jim Deebo. That's really impressive. Um, definitely, when I look at Seaholm as a postseason team, they are definitely a lock to get in the playoffs. Um, I've looked at all the scenarios for them. I mean, like, they are definitely a lock to get in the playoffs. Now, on the flip side of it with Troy, I'll tell you what, Troy's got some issues. I mean, they've only scored 12 points in two games and have allowed 94 points in the last three weeks. That's 31 points. Point three points a game. That's not winning football. That is, and you got to question their schedule now. Now you have to question it because is that schedule really getting you better, or playing a tougher schedule, or playing a tougher schedule? You know, yes, you're gonna, yes, you take some losses, but. Playing a tougher schedule will help you when it comes to the postseason. What didn't help things for Troy was now, you know, you kind of put yourself in a little bit of a jam. Um, I think for Troy, obviously, now for them, they got to win out. Because if Troy doesn't win out and their schedule is easy, it is it is soft when you look at Berkeley. You look at Troy Athens. I think Troy Athens is a tricky game there for them. And then they close out with Frazier. Frazier's, I mean, like, that to me, if that team doesn't win all three games, this team doesn't deserve to go to the playoffs. And here's the realization to that. It could happen. It could happen that they may not win three games. Because you look at that schedule. I think Troy Athens is a tricky game. I think with Vernon Burden there as the principal at Troy Athens, that is a trap game for Troy. Because that game against Troy Athens will say a lot about Troy. Because if that team does not win that game, then Troy Athens, then Troy will not be in the postseason. Troy Athens, I don't see an avenue for them getting in the postseason. Troy, right now, there is. So that's something to really keep an eye on. And then you had North Farmington and Oak Park. Um, this was a ugly game. Real ugly game. Nine to six was the score there. Fourth quarter, coming in the fourth quarter was three nothing in favor of North Farmington. And then um then they got a touchdown. Then they got a touchdown from um then they got a big touchdown from um Yep, they and they got a big one to make go up nine nothing. Um it was a huge, huge score at the time. But he got hurt. But he got hurt in that game. Um it was their running back, um, Duke Blanche. He had the not he had a touchdown from three yards out, but then he got hurt. And 
had to be carried off. Not sure what the condition is for him, but if they lose him, that's a big loss for Coach John Herstein's team. Um, but when I look at North playoff postseason wise right now, I mean, they have played a daunting schedule. They played against Groves, Caledonia, Seahome. Those three are not easy games. They have wins against Troy and Troy Athens, along with Oak Park. They still got to play Oxford, still got to play Bloomfield Hills. Um, I think when you look at North Farmington's chances of getting in the playoffs, they, they look good, but they have to beat, but they have to win out. I think they have to win out because you know, if North beats one of those teams, they'll probably qualify when you look at the schedule coming up for them. I mean, Oxford's going to be a tricky game for them. I think Oxford's a tricky game for North Farmington because you look at the Raiders' situation, you know? I mean, I think North Farmington looks good getting in. They have Pontiac this week. Then it's Oxford and Blue Hills. I think Oxford's the tricky, trickiest game for them. And I think that's a real crap game for North Farmington. If they win out, they're in. If they win two or three, I think they're in. But if they lose, they lose two or three, they're done. So that's my take on North Farmington. I think they're safe to get in, but they're on the they're clearly on the bubble right now. But they're clearly on the bubble. But if they win if they went out, if they win two or three, they're in the postseason. And then on Oak Park's case, um, tough loss for them. I mean, tough loss for them. I mean, they got a tough schedule coming up, too. I mean, you got Ferndale. That's a must-win game for them. Then you have to play West Bluefield to close out the year. That is brutal. That is absolutely brutal. And then you have, um, you know, and you've already played Avondale, which is tough. You've you got Seahome coming up. I mean, like, you know, that's going to be just brutal. I mean, you got to play Seahome, Ferndale, and um, West Bloomby to close out the year. Ferndale's a must win for them. If Oak Park does not win, if Oak Park, they got to win at least two or three to qualify for the postseason. Because, and I don't know if I see them qualifying. For the postseason. Just based on who they got to beat. But they have to win at least two or three. I mean, Ferndale's a must win for them. But if they don't beat Seaholm or West Bloomfield, then chances for them making the playoffs are pretty much shot. Because, because that's get, because I don't know if, because that Oxford game is looking rough right now for them. But I don't know if I see Oak Park getting in the postseason. I just don't know. So that's something to really watch. <laughs> when you look at the um the postseason um for Oak Park. So right now that's the challenge I have for them going forward. Is Ken Oak Park you know, they've got to win two or three, I think, if they want to make the playoffs. Um, let's look at, of course, the white now. You got Southfield Arson Tech had no issue with Bloopia Hills, 40 to nothing. Southfield's clearly a team that's safely in the playoffs. Um, Bloopia Hills, I don't see them getting in. They had their struggles with the Warriors. Um, it could have been worse. That's how bad it could have been. It could have been much worse. But it wasn't. It was 40 to nothing. So Southfield moves on. Bloopy Hills moves on. Um, end, of that, end of that game. Rochester 33, Farmington 7. This was an upset to me. I was shocked. And I watched that game again between Rochester and Farmington. It was Rochester's homecoming. Um... I thought Rochester looked like the better team on paper. Um, now, albeit, Farmington did not have Camp Pedley, which 
clearly makes a difference for Coach Jason Albright's team. When they don't have, obviously, your best athlete on the field playing, you're going to tend to struggle. And Farmington had at least two opportunities in the red zone, just couldn't cash in. Just couldn't cash in. So when I look at the situation, how that is, and albeit, um, albeit, um, you really, you know, you really can't, um, for Farmington, it looks like this could be a lost year, especially with the schedule coming up. You got, but there is still an avenue for Farmington to maybe get in the playoffs, but it's a really tough chore, especially when you have to play against Harper Woods. You got Lake Orion and Utica to close out the year. That's brutal. And Lake Orion and Utica are on the road. That is difficult. You know, for Farmington, that's going to be difficult. So when you really look at the Falcons' pass, honestly, if they win two or three, maybe could get them in. Two or three maybe gets them in. But they're going to have to play well again. They're going to have to either beat Lake Orion or Harper Woods. And I don't know if I see it with neither of those two teams. Not with the way Lake Orion's playing. And then Harper Woods, you know, Harper Woods has been up and down all year long. They've been up and down. But I'll talk Harper Woods in a minute. And then in Rochester's case, I don't know if I see a path for them to get in the postseason because of the schedule. Um, obviously, the Utica loss is absolutely killing them right now. Um, but for Rochester, it's a good win for them, especially for a young group that Coach Eric Vernon has. Um, so when you look at Rochester's case here, you know, I think for them, it's just building the program up, getting ready for next year for Coach Eric Vernon. I mean, you lost a lot of talent, especially in the skill positions. You found yourself a quarterback. Um, Jack Lauer, I think, is going to be a star next year. I think he's going to be a playmaker. I really like how Jack Lauer's been. I really do. He's really performed well to my expectations. He's really performed well. <laughs> so, that's my take on that. And then we had Groves and Harper Woods. Of course, that was a heck of a game between those two teams. Groves won that one 20-12 over the, over the Pioneers in Harper Woods. Um, like I said, it was going to be a tight game between those two teams. And it proved to me it was. Um, when you look at Groves, I'm going to go Groves first. I mean, Chris Little had a big night in that game. He had a touch. He caught it. He, had, he threw for a touchdown, and he also caught an interception. Um, Chris Little, we know. I I remember him. What he did against Savoni Franklin last year in the um regional finals. He was a big part of that game. And I know he's been pretty quiet this year a little bit for Coach Brendan Flirty, but he made his name known against a very good Harper Woods team. Very good Harper Woods offense that's loaded with proven talent on both sides of the ball. I mean, I've got it. I mean, like, he did a pretty good job against Nate Rushlow. I mean, Nate Rushlow, I thought, you know, the last few games, he's been playing really good for Harper Woods lately. Um, But for Groves, especially to win that game with that defense, it says a lot to where that team's been. And you look at the um, you look at that team now. Groves they have a lot of confidence heading into their final three weeks. Um, postseason watch, I think Groves is safe. I mean, yeah, the schedule is not as not as tempting. You got Bluebe, you got Bluebe Hills, Ferndale, and then Seaholm to close out the year. Um, I think Seaholm obviously is the toughest game of the three, but. When you really look at Groves' path, I mean, it's pretty safe um, for them to be in the postseason. I don't think they're going to have an issue with Bluefield Hills. Um, Ferndale is interesting because of the experience, but I think Groves is a little bit deeper. And then Seaholm, you know that game's always going to be a, um, 
a Donny broke between those two teams, especially, you know, when you look at previewing that game. That could be a heck of a match of week nine between those two. I mean, especially because everybody knows everybody. And I'm not sure how the enrollment works. I mean, I got Jim Dewald's thoughts. Um, you want to take a look at them? They're on my previous show. Um, but when you really look at Adam Groves' case here, I'm looking at Groves' postseason projection area. And according to Snooze Studios map, now Snooze Studios does a really good job with this. Mostly accurate with his stuff. But he has him going to water for Mott in the first round. Well, I think that might be North Farmington. You know, there might be. But he's got Groves. No, he's got Groves going to water for Mott in the first round. And I'm going like, what? This is going to be an interesting matchup if that were the case. Because Groves, I think, really matches up well with the Corsairs. They really do. I mean, I mean, they match up pretty well with the um, athletic quarterback and Caleb Osborne. If that was a matchup. You know, could you just imagine? I think Seelan would have the great part of the draw. Groves would have a, t a rough draw if that were the case. But we only, we had three weeks. We're still a lot of time to decide. You know? And Snooze to you, he does a really good job with posting his projections. He does a great job with them. So does Goose Poop. If you go on his um page on Twitter, you know what I mean? He does a really good job with his um postseason projections. He really does. Um, and then let's go to Harper Woods' case. Harper Woods, yeah, they're three and three, but they played a murder's row of a schedule. When you look at they're playing all D ones, all D twos. You know, when you look at the Pioneers case, and they're in D four. I mean, Harper Woods, they played a very brutal schedule. They have played Stony Creek, Lake Orion, Southfield, all in Division One. Then they played Groves in D two, and they still had to play. And, they, and they've already beaten Rochester, and they still got to play Clarkson and Roseville to close out the year. And that's Farm and Farmington as well. That's brutal for Harper Woods. It is really brutal for them to play all those schools that are higher in enrollment than they are. But I'll tell you what: if you get the wins, if you get the wins, I'll tell you what. Then that that is the more of the rewards if you can get the wins against D1 and D2 schools, considering that, considering you look at the rest of the teams in D4, you got some of them are playing D3, D, D, other D4s are playing D3s, they're playing D5s, I mean D6s. I mean, I mean, it is a good, I mean, for Harper Woods, you're in a beautiful spot because even if you have a losing record, I still think you would have a number one seed because just because of the schedule you played. Um, <laughs> and I look at that map and and look at Snoot Steve's map and, and he pretty much does it best. Harper Woods, I think regardless of the seed, if they get a number one seed, that's big. Because I'll tell you what right now, I could take Harper Woods and take him out to Goodrich and I think and I think Harper Woods goes up in the Goodridge and beats him. I really do. <laughs> and that's not and that is just honesty. The way I saw Goodridge play um, against Karana, I mean, that gives me that gives me a hint. I think Harper Woods going there to beat Goodridge. <laughs> I really do. I mean, I really like where Harper Woods is at right now. I really do. Playing playing all those red and white teams. Getting themselves better. <laughs> and obviously co talking to coach um, Rob Olden, um, he's right. He's right. You know what I mean? He, um, you know, playing those teams are going to get them better and they're going to get them playoff ready. <laughs> and I think Harper Woods right now, in my opinion, yes, they're three and three. Uh, they got their quarterback situation figured out. Um, I think they're going to be just fine. I just think they're going to be just fine. I like where the Pioneers are at right now. Just the way that program is. Um, I think they're going to be more than fine. <laughs> and then let's go to the red. Um, Oxford and Stony Creek. Um, Oxford won this game. 
Um, with that score being um being 38-28, Luke Johnson had a big game. He had two touchdowns. Jack Hendricks, <coughs> he grew up. He had three touchdowns. Three touchdowns. Including a catch to Liam O'Neal, 47-yard touchdown to um, Dean Rice, and a one-yard to Ian Jones. <coughs> so when you look at Oxford, this is big for them. This is huge for them. Because they needed a win like this. And people look at, okay, can this team be the 2021 version of the Wildcats where they had that incredible run in the postseason? There's some signs. The question for me is going to be for Oxford is, can they run the table? <laughs> That's the big question I have with Oxford. Is can they run the table? Because their next three games are West Bloomfield, North Farmington, and UD Jesuit. All three games are at Wildcat Stadium on the blue turf. I'm telling you, if Oxford wins all three games, they're in the playoffs. I mean, I'm writing that down right now. And Oxford was in a similar boat to this in 2021. Where they had to win out just to make playoffs. And I think they have a great chance to do it. Because West Bloomfield's got some problems. Especially on the defensive side of the ball. We got to break that one down in a minute. But for Oxford right now, your focus has to be on West Bloomfield this week. It has to be. So we'll see where their path goes. We'll see where their path goes. For Stony Creek, it's pretty much your postseason dreams are pretty much done. I mean, you sit one and five. Um, tough loss to Oxford. Had your chance in that game. Jane McCarthy had four touchdown runs in that game. He was incredible in that one. But when you look at Stony Creek, defense was their problem all year. Defense is still their problem. So when I look at this situation here with the defense, that could be a problem. I mean, you look at Stony Creek's next three games, you look at Adams, Rochester, New Baltimore, and Quebec. Stony, I think, has got a shot against Adams. They should beat Rochester, and then they close out the year against New Baltimore, and Quebec, and New Baltimore. And that's a motivation game for the Tarts. Because last year, Stony Creek won 21-20 and basically went in the postseason where the Tarts were eliminated. I don't know about New Baltimore and Anchorage's chances to getting in the postseason. You know, Snooze to you has them in the playoffs. I don't know why he's got all six Mac Red schools in, but I think that's going to change. Um, and I think that will change. Because I don't like New Baltimore Anchor Bay's schedule coming up. Nor Sterling Heights Stevenson's schedule coming up. So that's something to really watch for. Um, Lake Orion 35. Adams nothing. Who would have ever thought to see Adams get shut out by Lake Orion? Kudos to Lake Orion defense. I mean, that defense looked nasty. They look Nasty. I mean, Joey DeBrinca had a great game. Kane to Griffin Reed, all right. You know, he was all right. But Joey DeBrinca on the other side of that edge, my goodness. I got to give Austin Kahn a lot of credit, too. Also, Trey Pacmara for um, limiting Brady pre-scoring to one catch. That's, in, that's, in, that's insane. That's incredible. And then offensively for Lake Orion, Billy Robeson had a touchdown. Had had a touchdown. Tier Hill had a nice game. Um, I thought Dom Novak played well. And then um, then Rob, and then um, Raymond Payne had a nice game. Two touchdowns. So Lake Orion to me, they're a machine right now. They they're very much a machine right now. 
their offensive line's been playing really well as well. When you look at Jacob Escobedo, you look at Land Ferris, um, you look at, and then you got you got Connor Rourke, you have Connor McCartney on defensive line, um, Lane Garris up front on the defensive line. Yeah. Lake Orion's a machine right now. They really are. You know, postseason postseason um questions for Lake Orion. They're a lock. I mean, they're a lock. I mean, yeah, you got Farmington. You got Clarkson this week, you got Farmington, and you got Celine. Lake Orion's got Clarkson first. So we'll see what happens there. Um, Celine, we know at the end of the year, that'll be really interesting. That would be a really interesting game. Hypothetically, if both teams went in undefeated. Um, but we know Lake Orion's got a very tough game of Clarkson coming up. On Adams' side, I, I, it's hard for me to believe, it's hard for me to think, you know, what Coach Tony Petrito's thinking right now. Because... You just lost 35 not in the Lake Orion. You were shut out by the Dragons. Um, your offense didn't play well, and I think that's a credit to Lake Orion's defensive line. Lake Orion's defensive line, offensive line, were just better in that game. They were better in that game. Um, but when you look at the stats, stats don't lie here. Lake Orion sacked... Um, Ryan, Wa- Ryan Waters, five times. They forced a couple fumbles. Got a fumble for a touchdown in the end zone. Um, it was this Adams. They were young. They're a young team. They're a very young team. But, you know, when you look at the schedule coming up for Adams, you look at that. Adams, when I look at their schedule coming up, and right now, when I look at Rochester Adams' schedule, it looks manageable for them to get in the postseason, but there is a chance they could be out. I think they have the, they're have they probably the strongest of the bubble teams right now on my blog here. If you want to take a look at it, it's at Bay 450 at blogspot.com. Um... They still got Stony Creek, Bloopy Hills, and Sterling Heights Stevenson. All three of them are D1 teams. Um, I think Sterling Heights Stevenson is going to be their biggest test. But the one for Stony fans, that's at, at for Adams fans, it's at Adams. Um, Stony Creek's on the road. Bloopy Hills is at home. I think that's their homecoming for Adams. Um, they went out. They're definitely locking the playoffs. If they lose, if they if they win out or win two of the next three, they should be in. They lose two or three, or lose all three, which I don't see happening, then they might be out of the postseason. It's hard to envision Adams not being in the playoffs. It's hard not envisioning Tony Petrito, a Tony Petrito program being not making the playoffs. So that's the challenge that Adams has. This coming week. That's the challenge you have. So, we'll see what happens. Um, Clarkston, West Bloomfield. This was 44-36 in favor of Clarkston. Um, the game wasn't as close as the score indicated. Um, Griffin Bowman had three touchdowns. Um, leading the way for the Wolves. I thought Brady Collins had a great game for Clarkston. Um, especially running the zone read. Lucas Bowman was solid. Um, Brody Cozen had two touchdowns, including one from Desmond Stevens. Stevens, of course, with himself, he had a touchdown pass, caught an interception, and also had a touchdown score himself. So when you really look at Clarkston, um, you got, it's both Bowman twins, Brody Cozen, Desmond Stevens, um, and of course, the emergence of Brady Collins at quarterback. So Coach Jason Pintar has done a really nice job ever since their two early losses to Northville and Southfield Arts and Tech of really righting the ship. Their defense has been better. Um, 
Nick Wachesko has been a big part of that defense. Um, I think Clarkston right now is playing some of their best football. And that's a good sign for them. Especially hanging into this week against Lake Orion. So, I think when you look at Clarkston and say this, you know, they're playing their best football right now. They're a safe bet to get in the postseason. Their schedule is tough after Lake Orion. They still got Harper Woods and Utica Eisenhart Swinehart. That is not an easy trip going to Swinehart. Um, but when you look at Clarkson right now, they're in a good place right now. Really good place. And then when you look at West Bloomfield on West Bloomfield's side, this team could be in a little bit of trouble because of their defense has been not very good ever since the last four games. West Bloomfield's defense, they've allowed over 30 points in three of the last four weeks. And they got away with it against Stoney, and they got away with it against Adams. Then against Lake Orion or R.M. Clarkson. Bryce Rowe did not play in that game. And I don't know if he was hurt in that game or something. But him not playing played a big role in that game for West Bloomfield defensively. Obviously, Kari Jackson and Montel Johnson are out for the year with ACL and MCL injuries. So when you really look at West Bloomfield's situation, you know, the lack of a running game is a concern. You look at, of course, Raekwon Nance um, throwing the ball a lot to him, what Tyler Kep calls the bomb squad. You know, Elijah Durham's having a nice year for them. I mean, Marcus Morris is having a nice year. But they need more balance. They got to find that running attack. I mean, where is, where's Jalen Ailes? I mean, like, I'm wondering where he's been. Um, but they got to find, they got to find some balance. Coach Jack Kilbert, he, that's the bottom line. They've got to find balance. Because if you're one dimensionally running a lot on the pass, that could be a problem. That could be a serious problem, especially in the postseason, especially when the weather turns cold and you have to run the ball. I can't trust West Bloomfield's offensive line right now. I, it's hard for me to trust them. And you look at their schedule. I mean, yes, you've got Oxford this week. That's a brutal matchup for you. But then Southfield next week. That's tough. And then this Oak Park. That's tough. You're safe in the playoffs. Safely in the playoffs. Comfortably. That win against Chippewa Valley is huge. But you got to really shore up some things if you're Coach Jack Hilbert. You really have to shore up some things. Because if you don't, you're in trouble. I mean, that's what I'm looking at with, with West Bloomfield. They've got some things to address. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. All right, man. Picks for this week. Uh, for week number seven here. Um, let's look at the games this week. We got blue gold crossovers. Um, we got the blue gold crossovers. Um, and then we have the red, and then the red and white are closing out the um conference season. Um, Pontiac and North Farmington. This matchup here, I I just see North Farmington winning this one. I think, you know, Ryan Shelley's been playing well. Duke Blanche has been. Playing pretty well. <laughs> um, I I I see Pony. I see. Um, I think Pontiac will fight in this game. They're much improved, but I'm gonna take more farms in this game. Um, Berkeley and Troy. You know, I thought a couple years ago this would be a big game for me, but I just don't see it. I think Troy wins this one. I would say maybe by two scores. I mean, I'm going Troy here. Troy Athens, Royal Oak. Troy Athens win against Pontiac is huge. Um, I think it'll give them some confidence. Royal Oak, if they can simplify things offensively and then defensively, you know what I mean? I think Royal Oak's much better on the defense side of the ball than the offense side of the ball. But I'm, I'm going to take Troy Athens over Royal Oak in this one. Avondale and Seaholm, that's going to be a fun one. I mean, that'll be a heck of a game between a team that runs the misdirection or the wing tee against Severe. This could be a low-scoring game. This could be because both teams 
love to run the ball, and they're very efficient running the ball. Um, I but I think this is Avondale's biggest test of the year because besides the week two game against Wartonville, Brandon, this is going to be their biggest test. Are they for real or not? Are they worthy of the number four ranking? That's the question for Coach Bob Meyer and his team. I'm going to take Seaholm in this game because I just think the Maples are more battle-tested. Been in the forest. Um, I just think that, I just think the reason why it's more battle-tested is been Seaholm. Um, you have both Kenny boys, Kyle Robbins. It'd be a great game, I think, over there in, um, It'd be a really good game over in Birmingham. I mean, it'll be a fun one. That is for sure. But I'm going to take Seaholm in that one close. Ferndale Oak Park, big game for both teams here. Um, winner keeps their playoff hopes alive. Loser, I think it's basically done. Um, it's in Night Valley. Um, Ferndale's starting to turn things around a little bit. Oak Park, we just don't know much about it. We just don't know how um, they're going to respond after a tough loss in North Farmington. I mean, Ariel Guyton's a very good player. I like Colin Hawk in this game. I like Ferndale to pull off the um, shocker against Oak Park. Um, I, I think the Eagles right now, the way that they're playing, I think they're going to do well here, and I think they're going to make some noise here, um, hoping to get that last spot, hoping to make that last opportunity to get in the postseason, especially coming up here. Um, but Ferndale obviously having to win two or three. Oak Park needing to win out. Um, I, I see Ferndale winning this game against Oak Park. Um, to the white games. Southfield Rochester, this won't be close. Um, I got a &T pretty convincingly. Um, I think Rochester will fight in this one, but I just think Southfield, too much experience, too much explosive on offense. Um, I, I just think they're going to go and win that one pretty convincingly there. Groves and Bloomfield Hills, I don't see that one being close. Um, I like Groves in that one to knock out the Blackhawks pretty convincingly there. Um, Harper Woods and Farmington. Um, this one here, I, like I said, if Camp Petaway play, it's a, it's a big help for them, for Farmington. But I just don't see Harper Woods. I just don't see Farmington beating Harper Woods. I mean, like, obviously, when you look at the Pioneers, um, you know, obviously, you got Nate Rushlow's. I think he's going to have a, a breakout game here against Farmington, attacking their secondary. Um, I think Jacob Oden's going to have a big game defensively. Also on offense as well. So I'm going to take Harper Woods in this one here. They're going to get another big win in Farmington. Um, I really like the Pioneers in that game there. And then to the Red Games. We got here. Um, we got Adams and Stony Creek. Um, this game here, I'm not entirely sure of. Because Adams didn't look good last week against Lake Orion. Um, Stony Creek lost to Oxford. Uh, we don't know where both these teams are at. These Both these teams are in a crossroads. Um, when I look at, of course, Adams, obviously, Stoney, I mean, Adams, they're not the same they used to be. Yeah, they lost a lot of talent a year ago. But in this game with Stony Creek, we don't know where their mindset is, especially with, um, you know, Jalen McCarthy, you know, running the ball. That's not usually a good recipe for success. So I'm going to take Adams in this game because I, I just think the Highlanders, um, they're going to be in a foul mood after what happened to them against Lake Orion. Um, they've lost two straight games. Um, I just think Adams, with the, I think their offensive line, I think Ryan Waters, Ryan Waters gets that, gets back, gets, has a bounce back game. I think Brady Prescorn has a bounce back game. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to see how that one goes. But we'll see. Oxford and West Bloomfield. Um, you know, I mean, like West Bloomfield injury riddled defensively. Got Rick Nance, um, at quarterback. Elijah Durham there. Oxford's coming off an emotional high, and it's at Oxford. I'm going upset. Give me the Oxford Wildcats over West Bloomfield. I mean, like, I just think that the way Oxford played in that West Bloomfield game, I mean, like, it's, I mean, like, in that, in that game against Stony Creek, that's got, 
that should bring fear into West Bluefield. Um, yes, West Bloomfield's got all the D1 athletes, but I think Oxford's grounded tough. It's going to be a physical game. Um, yes, I mean, yes, they got Brandon Davis Swain, but I, I just think West Bloomfield, um, I just think for West Bloomfield, I mean, like, I don't know where they're at defensively, especially coming off a loss like that against Clarks where they got 44 points. Um, so that's something to really watch for there. Um, but I've got Oxford. I mean, this has a lot of similarities to the 2021 team when Oxford had to win out just to make the playoffs. It's got a lot of similarities there. So I've got Oxford in the upset against Stony Creek. Oh, no, against West Bloomfield in that game. And then the last game, Lake Orion and Clarkston. Um, Justin Pintar, Clarkston coach, did say something on, on, um, on the D zone. And he did say that, um, you know, Lake Orion's a great team, but Clarkston's better. Um, I wonder if that got to Lake Orion or not, because Lake Orion, we know they're motivated after what happened, um, last year, losing to Clarkson 45-41 on their homecoming. Um, we also know that, um, you know, and then now hearing that, those comments, that's going to get them further incensed. Um, and I think Lake Orion's going into Clarkson, going with heavy, with heavy hard hats in there. Yes, Clarkson's got Desmond Stevens, they got the Bowman Twins, Brody Coe's in. Brady Collins. I just think Lake Gordon goes in there and just beats Clarkson. I mean, like, I, I just think that uh, Billy Roberson there, you got Raymond Payne, um, T.R. Hill. Um, I think this is a shootout, but I just think Lake Orion, I like, they're better defensively, so it's Clarkson in that game, but at the end of the day, experience favors Lake Orion in that game. Um, I think the Dragons will find a way to stop that some Stevens, um, stop the Bowen Twins, um, and Brady Coz and Brady and Brody Cozen. Um, I just think Lake Orion goes in there and wins that game against Clarkson by a touchdown. This one, I think it'll be a tight game for sure, but we'll see what happens. I mean, it'll be a heck of a game over at Clarkson between the Dragons and the Wolves. I mean, a lot to really look at when you look at that game. Um, make sure you all follow the blog at second away for the city at blogspot.com for the latest information around the OA, and we'll see what happens going forward. All right, we're gonna sign off here. Take care, God bless. And I'll see you all next week. Take care and see you then. God bless all. God bless you.